Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, this afternoon, joining me and my wife over there this afternoon. I uh, really uh, appreciate your taking the time out of your day to pray with me and to uh, look at a psalm today. I have been getting a little bit of cabin fever. Uh, have you been getting that too? I imagine that we are all getting a little bit antsy staying in our homes. And um, today I um, need to go to the bank and haven't got there yet. Go through drive through and um, maybe a errand or other uh, two other things that I stay in the car. I don't get out of the car, pick up a prescription and so on. But I hope you've been finding um, good things to do at home as well as I said yesterday, uh, taking a good rest. So um, yesterday we prayed for the city of New York and for the state of New York. They're getting re hit really, really hard. Our nation now has almost a quarter of a million cases of COVID-19, the highest of any country in the world now. Uh, we have surpassed everybody else. And New York uh, and New Jersey are among the highest states right now. Um, I was impressed today to pray for our cities uh, and also our state, um, our own state, uh, Washington State. I was just looking at uh, some of the st uh, statistics on the Washington State website uh, for COVID-19. And it says in King County now, as of uh, yesterday, we had 2,468 cases with 165 deaths. Uh, and then in Kitsap County, we have 77 cases, zero deaths. Uh, looking down to Pierce County uh, is pretty high, 352 cases and seven deaths. And in Snohomish is really high up wherever it is, 1,221 uh, cases with 38 deaths. And so these are predominantly centered in the cities. And so I imagine that in Kitsap County, it's here in Bremerton and maybe Silverdale. Um, in King County, I think a large amount of it is in Kirkland because of that nursing home and all, also in Seattle and so on. And I, I think I, I can't help but think of cities all over our country. Um, we, every government is faced with this at every level at the national level, at state level, and at the city level. Um, and so let's pray today for our cities. And as I pray for our cities and state, you can pray along for your city and state. I know that Gardnerville is one of those cities out there in Nevada where some of you are watching. So let's pray. Father, again, I, I thank you for today and I thank you for the gift of life. I thank you that we get to live today, that you've given us breath today and beating hearts and the joy of the Lord and the peace of Christ, which passes all understanding. Father, I pray for our cities today, for Bremerton and Port Orchard and Silverdale, Paulsbo, uh, Gig Harbor, Tacoma, Seattle, Spokane, Longview, Kelso, uh, Olympia, Lacey, Tumwater, Gardnerville, and so many other cities around the nation where uh, city governments are having to determine how to proceed within their own cities, Lord. And I just pray for wisdom, again, for wisdom and capacity and skill for the uh, executors, the mayors, the councils, beyond their own ability and beyond their own understanding. I pray that you would use this in our cities to draw people to you, Lord. I pray that your spirit would convict the world of sin, that you would also shine the light of the glory of God in the face of Christ into their hearts, that you would turn on the light switch of their hearts, that they may know that you are real, that Jesus Christ truly lived on this earth and gave up his life and was resurrected again, having been seen by more than 514 eyewitnesses. That which we have seen, that which we have heard, that which we have touched, we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. Father, I pray that you would turn people's hearts towards home. We all have eternity in our hearts, Lord, that longing to live forever that longing not to succumb to death or to sorrow and grief and mourning and sickness and pain. 
So Father, I pray, I know that you love our cities. You love Bremerton, you love Seattle. You love Port Orchard, you love Belfair, Shelton, Centralia and Chehalis, Paulsbow and Silverdale, Hoquiam and Aberdeen, Everett, Tacoma, and Gardnerville. Father, I just uh, thank you that in that love, sometimes you do what's best for us, or always you do what's best for us. Your word says that true love, which I think is a love of the Father and love of the Son, never seeks its own. And so, God, we know that you never seek your own good. You're always seeking our highest good and the world's highest good. That clarion call, calling us home, calling us to repent, to turn away from our sin, but to be persuaded of who you are, of, to be persuaded of who Jesus is, to be persuaded that he is the Son of God, that he is God in the flesh, and that he is the Messiah, the one who came to take all of our sin, all of our wrongdoing, all of our selfishness, all of our rebellion in his own body, and then offering up his life as a sacrifice on the cross. He who knew no sin, Jesus who knew, knew no sin, became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God, that we might become the moral health of God. Father, thank you, Lord. Thank you for uh, what Jesus did for us. Thank you that that love uh, continues, uh, Father, for our cities. That that clarion call of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, the gospel of grace, continues to go out. Help us to be bold. Give us boldness beyond our own capacity. Give us opportunity and open doors, even through social media and through telephone calls. Give us open doors. Give us words or utterance, Lord. Supply us with the words we need. And when you give us the words, may we speak them with clarity. And Father, in the midst of it all, I pray that you would give us boldness beyond our own ability, beyond our own timid, timid, timidness, and beyond our own fear, Lord. You would give us boldness to share this incredible news that we have, that Jesus has already forgiven the sin of the world and beckons us to receive the gift of life, the gift of eternal life, by entrusting our lives to you, by believing uh, that Jesus is the Son of God, the Messiah, the one who is coming into the world. So Father, we entrust our cities into your hands. We pray that whatever your will, that that will would be accomplished in our cities. We pray, our request is that you would bring this pandemic quickly to a close, Lord. Again, when the great storm uh, came upon the disciples while they were on the lake, you, you spoke out and said, peace, be still. And it says a great calm came over the waters. In this great storm we find ourselves in, Lord, we cry out to you, speak that good word, peace, be still. And may we see a great calm come over our lives. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, thank you for uh, joining me today. Um, today we're going to be looking at another psalm. It's Psalm 7. It's a song of lament, and it's a psalm of David. So let's begin. We begin with the title of, this, of, of the psalm. It says, uh, Shigayon of David. Shigayon, we don't really know what it is, whether it's a musical term, whether it, it may mean lament, a lament of David. It certainly is a calling out, uh, out of sorrow and grief and pain and anguish, which he sang to the Lord concerning Cush, a Benjamite. Uh, I like his name, Cush, he's Cush. Cush, a Benjamite. A Shigayon of David, which he sang to the Lord concerning Cush, a Benjamite. 
So let's read it together and then we'll return and, and uh, do a few reflections on it. Psalm 7. O Lord my God, in you I have taken refuge. Save me from all those who pursue me and deliver me. Or he will tear my soul like a lion, dragging me away while there is none to deliver. O Lord my God, if I have done this, if there is injustice in my hands, if I have rewarded evil to my friend, or have plum plundered him who without cause was my adversary, let the enemy pursue my soul and overtake it, and let him trample my life down to the ground, and lay my glory in the dust. Arise, O Lord, in your anger. Lift up yourself against the rage of my adversaries and arouse yourself for me. You've appointed judgment. Let the assembly of the peoples encompass you and over them return on high. The Lord judges the peoples. Vindicate me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and my integrity that is in me. O let the evil of the wicked come to an end but establish the righteous. For the righteous God tries the hearts and minds. My shield is with God, who saves the upright in heart. God is a righteous judge, and a God who has indignation every day. If a man does not repent, he will sharpen his sword. He has bent his bow and made it ready. He has also prepared for himself deadly weapons, he makes his arrows fiery shafts. Behold, he, speaking of Cush, travails with wickedness, and he conceives mis mischief and brings forth falsehood. He has dug a pit and hollowed it out, and has fallen into the hole which he made. His mis mischief will return upon his own head, and his violence will descend upon his own pate, or his own crown. I will give thanks to the Lord according to his righteousness and will sing praise to the name of the Lord Most High. So again, we have we start with Shagion of David, which he sang to the Lord concerning Cush, a Benjamite. Apparently, Cush was a fellow that he had been in covenant with, a friend. Uh, in the Hebrew language, when you said friend, uh, it wasn't used in the, in the manner that we use friend as just I have a good friend or a best friend or uh, she's a friend, he's a friend. Uh, it meant that you were in covenant with that person. So here's someone that David had trusted who in turn had trusted him. And the psalm is about Cush who turns on David. So let's. I'm going to uh, probably not take as much time with this to go through every verse because it's a, very, a much longer psalm. But I'll try to highlight uh, the, the key points of, of this psalm and then do a few reflections uh, on it as we go. O Lord my God, in you, who I, in you I have taken refuge. We start off with a wonderful uh, idea for today, for the, the pandemic. O Lord my God, in you I have taken refuge. If you haven't taken refuge in, in the Lord, in Yahweh, in Jesus, then I encourage you to take refuge in him. He is our safety. He is our comfort zone. He is our safe zone, if you will, especially since we have the promise of life that we are given eternal life the moment we believe, given that abundant life to live out day by day, living in the uh, immeasurable love of Christ. O Lord, my God, in you I have taken refuge. Save me from all those who pursue me. So Cush was the uh, one who had brought the accusation against David. We'll see what that is in a minute. But he has, he's a representative of others, and now they're chasing David down because they think that David has betrayed them. And so he says, save all those who pursue me and deliver me, or he will tear my soul like a lion, dragging me away while there is none to deliver. I've seen uh, videos of uh, lion, lions taking down their prey and then tearing their flesh apart. What a visual picture. Um, Hebrew people thought in uh, terms not so much of abstract thought, but in terms of words that were pictures and ideas that gave them pictures, poetic pictures often, 
or he will tear my soul like a lion, dragging me away. So he's being pursued hotly. I love these uh, backgrounds. They're from Josiah Smith of motionworship.com. This series called uh, Digital Mountains is specifically about David and him fleeing into caves. I don't know if you've noticed that, but uh, fleeing through the mountains. And so they're very appropriate for our Psalms right now. Thank you to Josiah and to motionworship.com. Uh, we go on and it says, O Lord, my God, if I have done this, if there is injustice in my hands, if I rewarded evil to my friend or have plundered him without cause, who without cause was my adversary? Um, what's he's getting at? He's getting at, look it, I didn't do what they're accusing me of doing. They're saying I've, I've broken the covenant, that I betrayed them. I did not do it. They're falsely accusing me. They're falsely uh, pursuing me. They're falsely trying to take my life. I have not rewarded evil to my friend. And so he then calls down an oath on himself. He says, if I've done this, let the enemy pursue my soul and overtake it and let him trample my life to the ground, meaning take my life and lay my glory in the dust, the glory that he has received from the father as king. And then it says Selah, and that means pause. Can you say that about your life? Uh, he's speaking specifically of this one incident here. So he's not claiming righteousness in every part of his life. Uh, this is an early psalm of David's because this is before he was actually king. Uh, I said, lay my glory in the dust. At this point, uh, he maybe, maybe have been promised the kingship as that young shepherd boy, but he has not achieved it yet because he's uh, pursuing, uh, uh, if he was king, he would put an end to these men very quickly. Um, it goes on and it says, arise, O Lord, in your anger. Lift up yourself against the rage of my adversaries and arouse yourself for me. Notice the three words, arise or awaken, O Lord. Lift up yourself and arouse yourself. So these three words that talk about uh, standing up and coming to his rescue. Arise, O Lord. There we have Yahweh again. And uh, we can also interpret in the mystery of the uh, Trinity that that's Jesus. Arise, O Lord, in your anger. We don't always think of God as a God of anger, but he rises up in anger and notice this, lift up yourself against the rage of my adversaries. And so his adversaries, Cush, and his followers, his uh, fellow uh, accusers, uh, are in a rage against David, pursuing him hotly, trying to take his life. And so David asks God to reciprocate with his anger to their rage. Uh, and arouse yourself for me. Stand up. You have appointed judgment. So he's asking God to be a judge between Cush and his followers and between David. Let the assembly of, of the peoples encompass you. He was asking for the Israelites um, to uh, surround God in his judgment and to support God in whatever the judgment is. And over them return on high and then to return to his seat uh, after the judgment. The Lord in, in heaven, the, the place of rule and so on. It says, the Lord judges the peoples. Vindicate me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and my integrity that is in me. Here the Lord, Yahweh, Jesus, judges the peoples. And it, what it means is he judges them justly and with righteousness. He's not unfair. He doesn't take brides. He, he's not crooked. He doesn't lie. He judges people fair, judges people, peoples fairly. He says, vindicate me, O Lord. I, I haven't done anything wrong. They're falsely accusing me according to my righteousness. He's not talking about the grand, the grand scope of his life because he could not stand, neither could we. But in this uh, one instance, he's he knows he's not done anything wrong. And so he's asking God to vindicate him. And my integrity that is in me, he says, I've done nothing wrong. I've been a man of integrity in this. And then it goes on and it says, oh, let the evil of the wicked come to an end, but establish the righteous. Now he's talking globally. Oh, let the evil of the wicked come to an end, but establish the righteous. Well, um, here we have a problem. For the righteous God tries the hearts and minds. My shield is with God who saves the upright in heart. Who is able to stand as a righteous man before God? I only know one person, that's Jesus Christ. So we read this, uh, uh, these verses uh, from Paul in Romans chapter 3 is inspired by the Holy Spirit. We read them yesterday. I want them want to read them again. Because when he says, Oh, let the evil of the wicked come to an end, but establish the righteous. The only one he, he can establish as righteous is Jesus himself. 
So uh, taking a look at Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 18 again, I'm just going to read it, listen to it. These are true words, all taken from the law and from the Psalms and, and the prophets, taken from the Hebrew scriptures. And so as it is written in the Hebrew scriptures, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. Words quoted from our psalm yesterday. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways, and the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. And this is the rub, that this describes the entire creation, from Adam and Eve until the day of the Lord, and everyone in between. We've all, there is no one righteous, not even one, save the Lord Jesus Christ. So if I go back to my text in... Um, Let me see here. Oh, let the evil of the wicked come to an end, but establish the righteous. For the righteous God tries the hearts and minds. If we were to stand under the judgment of God, we would all be toast. If he was just just, he would send us all to hell, to destruction, to eternal destruction in hell. Uh, he is more than just. He is more than fair. I remember speaking at a local church uh, in the area when I was a missionary on itineration and I spoke on the wonderful uh, love of God, how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love which surpasses knowledge. And a couple came up to me afterwards and says, Pastor Grant, don't forget that God is just. Meaning you kind of half blew it, Lord uh, Grant, because you, you forgot that God is just, that he... Uh, serves justice on the evildoers. That's true. I'm glad that God is just. When I think about things like the Super Bowl, during the Super Bowl, the city that it's in, the sexual trafficking, uh, even underage girls being forced into sexual trafficking, that goes through the ceiling uh, during those events. It's justice to bring those pimps and those Johns to justice. And there's justice for people who are abuse, abusive. There's justice for people who are racist. racist. There's justice for um, those who persecute and murder other people. We know that in society. That's why we have laws. And yet, which of us can stand? For the righteous God tries the hearts and minds. If he was to try your heart and mind, can you, can you imagine if all of our thoughts over the past week were made public on a big screen in like central, uh, in uh, the big screen in New York City? Shudder the thought what uh, can go through my mind in a week. Um, but get this, my shield is with God for who saves the upright in heart. So who, who are the upright in heart? In of ourselves, we're not an upright in heart. Romans chapter 3 lays that to rest. None of us. There is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who good, does good, not even one. And so then we turn to Philippians. And I love these verses. This is uh, Paul, a Pharisee, who is a Pharisee of Pharisees. Well, let's read his credentials and then his response to his credentials. I think in, the, in after the cross, this is what it means to take up our cross, to deny everything that is to our credit, deny all of our good works, to realize that they are worthless. So let's read Philippians chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Finally, my, my brethren, and it would be to my sisters too, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things again is no trouble to me. So he said these things before to the Philippians. And it is a safeguard for you. Beware of the dogs, beware of the evil workers, Beware of the false circumcision, those Judaizers who would come into the church and say that you need to be keeping uh, all of the law or part of the law and you need to be circumcised. Beware of the false circumcision, for we are the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. David was putting some confidence in his flesh. We put no confidence in our flesh. Uh, in Romans it says, uh, there is no good thing that dwells in the flesh. Although I myself, this is Paul speaking, although I myself 
uh, might have confidence even in the flesh. If anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. And then he, here he is, his pedigree, his uh, credentials, his re resume, circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, the most favored uh, tribe, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is found in the law, found blameless. I cannot claim that, and I suspect that you cannot claim that e either. Here is a formidable man in his effort as a Pharisee to, uh, to keep every last jot and tittle of the law. Those were the, the, the dots and the crossing of the T's, if you will. Uh, it wasn't the crossing of the T's, but it was the little markings uh, in the Hebrew language. Every jot and tittle of the law. And now let's see what he does with his pedigree, what he does with his red, uh with his uh, heritage, what he's done with his uh, resume. But whatever things were gained to me, all these things were gained to me. Those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. I forsake all of my own merit, all of my own status for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be in loss in view of the sur surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, to know his kind love, to know uh, the extravagance of his grace, this grace which is always sufficient for us, to know the boundless reaches of the how wide and long and high and deep love of Christ. Uh, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. I give up being an Israelite. I be, be, give up being a Pharisee. I give up being a Benjamin, Benjaminite. I give up being a persecutor of the church. I give up uh, being found blameless under the law. I give up being a Pharisee. And maybe uh, and count them but rubbish so that I may, may gain Christ. This word rubbish, we're too polite in our uh, sensibilities as Christians to actually accurately translate it. If you go back to the King James, the old King James, you'll, you'll find the word dung there. It's a very crude term. Uh, it's uh, akin to the word crap. He counts all of these good things, all of his merit, but crap. There's even a more uh, crass word, which is probably more akin to this word, but in my sensibilities, I don't want anything unwholesome to pass from my mouth. But get this, he counts being an Israelite, being a Benjamite, being a Pharisee, being a, a zealot uh, of the most favored tribe, as to the law found blameless, as to zeal a persecutor of the church. He counts this all crap that he might gain Christ, so that he might gain Christ, and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, David in his psalm is saying, judge us by our righteousness. None of us can stand. None of us can stand. Not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, meaning I have to follow the dictates of the law, and by my effort I produce a righteous life. But that which is through faith in Christ, through trusting Christ, and literally it's, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. And so righteousness comes to us as, as a gift. It comes to us as a gift from God because we've put our trust in him, because what he, we have been persuaded to believe what he has said about his son. That's our ground for righteousness, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of our trusting him. So we return back to our psalm. Oh, let the evil of the wicked come to an end, but establish the righteous. For the righteous God tries the hearts and minds. My shield is with God, who saves the upright in heart. We are upright in heart, those of us who, in, who have entrusted ourselves into the ark of Christ. Uh, God is our shield. Um, but we are not upright in ourselves. We are upright because of the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, on the basis of belief, on the basis of trusting God. All English words which are translated from the same Greek word. We continue, God is a righteous judge and a God who has indignation every day. He's fed up with people every day, fed up with people who are sex trafficking, fed up with uh, men who are abusive to their wives, 
and so on and so on. If a man does not repent, if a man does not repent of his sin, change his mind, he will sharpen his sword. He has bent his bow and made it ready. He has prepared for himself deadly weapons. He makes his arrows fiery shafts. And I think, which of us could stand? I'm so glad that these words are within the old covenant. We stand under a different covenant, a different agreement, a different contract. I hate that word for this, but a different covenant with God, a covenant of grace, a covenant of the shed blood of Jesus. And nevertheless, he still disciplines both the world and us. It goes on, it says, Behold, he travails with wickedness. That travail means uh, the tra travail that a woman has in labor. So behold, this Cush, the Benjamite, and his followers, he travails, he labors with wickedness, meaning he's ready to give birth to all kinds of wickedness, all kinds of lawbreaking, all kinds of criminal acts. And he conceives mischief. He's giving, uh, he conceives the idea of conception. He conceives mischief, mischief and brings forth falsehood. He brings forth lies. And so when uh, he uh, is pregnant with wickedness and he conceives mischief, mischief what's born is lies. And then he gets uh, to this profound thought, which I think is true for all ages. He has dug a pit and hollowed it out, and has fallen to the hole which he, has, he made. Our actions have consequences, folks. Our sin has consequences, whether we're uh, Christians or not Christians. Our actions have consequences. Our sin, our rebellion, our selfishness has consequences. By our sin, we dig our own hole, and then we fall into it. He's digging the hole to trap David, in, in a sense. He's using, a, again, this wonderful pictorial language. He's setting a trap for David, so David comes along. We used to build these when we were kids. We would dig a big hole and cover, cover it over with leaves and branches and make it look like it wasn't there in hopes that we'd catch a, a wild animal. We never did. Uh, of course, uh, if you forgot that it was there later on, which happened to me, I would come and fall into my own hole. Um, his mischief will return upon his own head. And his violence will descend upon his own pate or his own crown. Pate is an old term for uh, your head. And so there, this is a, a theme that Jesus brings out. The measure which you measure will be measured unto you. And so on. Um, I'm glad that we stand under the covenant of grace. Does that mean that we get away with sin? May it never be. May it never be. When I understand what Jesus has done for us on the cross, that he gave up his life for you and for me, that he gave up his spirit, that he chose to die on our behalf, and that he was then raised to life. He descended uh, into Hades, uh, is, as the Apostles' Creed says. It doesn't say that um, in, the, uh, in the New Testament. It says that he went and preached to those who were in prison. But he did this all in order for you and me, not seeking his own good, but seeking our highest good. Um, I'm glad that when we stand under the forgiveness that God brings, there will be no judgment. We will be held responsible for what we have done in the flesh at the Bema seat of Christ, at the judgment seat of Christ. We will be rewarded for everything that we allowed the Holy Spirit to do in and through us. And everything will be else will be burned up in a bonfire. I'm going to have quite a bonfire, and I suspect that you too will have quite quite a bonfire. But to come to the Lord and say, "Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Do your good work in and through me each day. Let me be your witness. Let me be your voice. Let me be your hands. Let me be your your feet. Let the mind of Christ be full in me." And for those things which we allow the Holy Spirit to do, we will be rewarded uh, richly. I irony, ironic, isn't it? And then we conclude with, I, I will give thanks to the Lord according to his righteousness. Here we have the truth. I will give thanks to the Lord, to Yahweh, to Jesus, according to his righteousness. I'm reminded of those words in Matthew 6, I think it's 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Seek ye first the king. How do you find a kingdom but by seeking the king? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these other things we go after will be added unto you. Seek the Lord's righteousness. I will give thanks to the Lord according to his righteousness. Thank you, Lord, for giving us the gift of righteousness that comes from the Lord, not on the basis of the deeds we have done, not on the, on the basis of our keeping any part of the law, but on the basis of this gift from God, which comes to us through our faith, through trusting God. 
and will sing praise to the name of the Lord Most High. We sing praises to the name of Yahweh Most High. He is the Most High God. He is above all other uh, would-be gods. He is all uh, over all our would-be idols. I will give thanks to the Lord. That's a wonderful place to end in, the, in, our, in our talk today, in our looking at this psalm. In the midst of this pandemic, can we give thanks to the Lord? according to his righteousness, and sing praise to the name of Yahweh Most High. Amen. I hope uh, this was helpful to you uh, today. We do have enemies that sometimes pursue us in our lives or people who just get under our skin. In the New Covenant, we forgive our enemies. We pray for our enemies. We forgive those who persecute us. Uh, I'll be returning tomorrow uh, on Friday for uh, Psalm 8, and uh, we'll begin again at 11.55 with a countdown, and then beginning at noon to look uh, to pray together, and then to uh, read through Psalm 8. It's a wonderful psalm. Let's pray. Father, I just uh, thank you for the righteousness which fr comes from God on the, right, uh, on the basis of faith. The righteousness which was wrought for us, which was achieved for us through Jesus' uh, death on the cross. I thank you that we're coming up on Good Friday. I thank you that we're coming up on Palm Sunday and Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday, as I like to call it, where we remember yearly what you've done for us in giving up your life and undergoing the persecution prior to the cross and then the unthinkable treatment and the cruelty of dying on a cross that we might live. Again, I pray for our world that you would bring us through this pandemic, that you would turn millions of hearts to you, that we would cry out as a world to you, save us, O God. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Hear our lament. And now you can join me in saying the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into, into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. For thine, Lord, is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thanks for joining us today, uh, for joining Nancy and I. Hope you can come back tomorrow. I miss all of you very much. You know that I love all of you very much, and I uh, pray that you will find peace today, that you will find rest in the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. Uh, uh, on the basis of faith. Thanks again for coming. We'll see you tomorrow.